Quiet, please. Quiet, please. The American Broadcasting Company presents Quiet, Please is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for today is called Meet John Smith, John. I'm funny about snow, I guess. Yeah, I get sentimental about it. I get, I get silly about it, the way some people get about pussy willows and persithia in the springtime or the way you get about kids or dogs or... Siamese cats, you know. I was looking at the post the other day, and there were some pictures of the fighting in the bulge. Uh, when was it? Four years ago, Christmas time? Soldiers wearing white sheets over them, tanks painted white, the snow sifting down, the little pine trees piled thick with it. And I thought how awful fellas having to fight and kill each other at Christmas time in the snow. And blood on the snow. There oughtn't to be blood on the snow. The snow's kind of... Yeah, all right, sacred. I always thought ever since I was a kid, I, I hope it's snowing when I die. You ever feel that way? Snow. Peaceful snow. Yeah, it's the only thing on this earth, you know, that's really eternal. It's always here. Sure, it goes away from the lowlands in the hot weather, but up high there's always snow, always been snow. Why, even down on the equator there's snow all year round. I can even remember the names of some of the mountains. Aconcagua, isn't that right? Aconcagua and Kilimanjaro. Remember, Hemingway even wrote a story about that. Snows of Kilimanjaro, wasn't it? Sure, swell story. See, the man reads books. But I was talking about snow, about how I always hoped it would be snowing when I die. If I will get to ten, it will be. I'd be a chump to bet against you, I know. Well, all that's a long way around to making a start. But the snow was the reason for it, you see. And the snow will be flying again pretty soon. I'll be glad to see it, even if... Oh, well. It was New Year's Day, 1939. New Year's Day... Lucille and I had had some people in for New Year's Eve. We had a lot of champagne. They brought a lot of champagne. Somebody brought some other stuff. You ever try avocado? Avocado. It's a Holland Dutch concoction. It's kind of a custard. It's got schnapps in it. You eat it with a spoon, and somebody comes and hits you with a railroad tie. Johnny King had a kind of vodka I never heard about. Zubravka, I think it's called. It's got an infusion of buffalo grass, whatever that is in it. Yeah, it tastes wonderful, kind of like tobacco. In the summer afternoon, in a field of hay. And boy, howdy. Champagne and avocado and zubrotka. Headaches and hangovers and shooting pains. It was Lucille's idea to go over to the Lafayette and drink a, or eat or whatever you do to it, some onion soup. And oh, boy, it was snowing. I felt some better as we walked over. We got inside and ordered and sat there by the front window at the marble top table and pushed the plush curtains aside and looked out. It was snowing awful hard, big fat flakes floating down and people going by with their hats and their shoulders piled high. And loving it, most of them. So we had some soup. We began to feel partially human again. Lucille leaned across the table. Ah, oh, that poor old fella. What poor old fella, me? Nobody pays any attention to him. Where? Out there in the snow. See, there goes another one. Hey, what are you talking about? The old man out there in the corner. People are passing him off. Well, what do you want him to do? John, go give him a dime or something. Where? There. Oh, gosh. Isn't it a shame? Begging in the snow. Yeah, doggone it. See, there goes another one. Oh, gee. The poor old guy's probably starving. Oh, now New Year's Day in the snow. 
Uh, order me some more onion soup. What? Uh, oh, give me a dollar, will you? Um, five's the smallest I've got. Well, give me that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'll be right back. John, take your coat. Uh, I don't need any coat, I said, and I busted right out and down the steps in the snow. No hat or anything. And I called to the poor old fellow. Hey, I called. Hey, bud. Uh, me, mister? Yeah. Mister, have you got a dime? I'll tell you what. I'm, I'm about frozen. It's New Year's Day and... Here. Oh, my gosh, mister. Go get something to eat, bud. Find yourself some place to sleep and get warm. Oh, gosh. A, a fin. It's all right. New Year's present for my wife and me. Wife? Waving at you there in the window. Oh. Oh. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Mom. Thank you ever so much. Yes, Mom. Thank you. God bless you, Mom. God bless you, too, mister. It's all right. We all have tough luck. Happy New Year's. Well, same to you, mister. Gosh, it's been a long time since anybody said that to me. Yeah, your wife's tapping on the window. She wants you to come in before you catch your death of cold. Oh, yeah. Well, good luck, bud. Hey, mister. What's your name? Yeah, what difference does that make? Go get, go get something to eat. Why, I was just thinking I could walk over to Grace Church and I... Well, I, I could say a prayer for you, uh, sir. I, I was going to pray anyway and... Thanks, partner. Uh, my name's John Smith. It is? Well, what do you know about that? What? That's my name, too. John Smith. <laughs> That's all. His name was John Smith. My name's John Smith. Then we met in the snow on New Year's Day ten years ago. Yeah, I know. I stood there in the snow and shivered a minute watching him clump away through the snow, and I thought, oh, boy, I thought, John Smith. There, but for the whatever it is goes this John Smith. And Lucille down here busted the window wrapping on it with her wedding ring, making faces at me to come in before I froze, too. Well, so New Year's Day in 1939 was on a Sunday that made Monday the holiday, and I didn't have to work. We just sat around the house loafing and drinking up what was left of the New Year's champagne. And along towards the evening, I said, You mind if I go out for a walk, Lucille? She said, No, go ahead. So I put on my leather jacket and my overshoes, went out and walked in the snow. It was black and dirty already, like it always is in New York. And I thought, well, maybe it'll still be nice over in Washington Square. So I ambled over there. Yeah, it was nice. The lights and the stuff, you know. The tree was still there alongside the arch, and, and I brushed the snow off a bench and sat down for a minute. Wasn't anybody else in the square except me, I thought. But all of a sudden, somebody said, kind of quiet. You know how flat voices sound when there's snow? And this voice said, Hello, Mr. John Smith. And I looked up, and darn if it wasn't my little old man, little old John Smith. Well, I said, Hello yourself, John Smith. I thought that was you, uh, sir. How you doing? Well... Gee, that thing you gave me yesterday brought me awful good luck, Mr. Smith. John. Huh? John, that's my name. Oh. Uh, what you mean, good luck? Well, I got me a job shoveling snow this morning, and I made four bucks. That's fine. Uh, I, I could give you back part of the five if, if you wanted me to. Ah, forget it. No, I, I, I'd really like to pay it back. I, I mean... Some other time. Well, uh... I got seven bucks all together, Mr. Uh, John. Well, what What if I bought you a drink? W would you mind? Well, say now. I don't mind if I do. Ah, swell. That's fine. You, you like to walk over to McSorley's with me, huh? I used to go there. Well, sir, I thought. A mug of ale would go all right, I thought. Yes, sir, and it'll make the old boy feel better. Yeah, I was full of holiday spirit. Come on, John Smith, I said. Let's not walk to McSorley's. Let's run. 
You know McSorley's on 7th Street, just off the Bowery there, Mike Cooper Union? <sighs> Grand place. No women, no chromium plating. Just a battered old bar, a couple of cats, four-inch sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs, and ale. Boy, howdy. Hmm. Yeah, and in the wintertime, the big old stove in the front room, red hot and still a-heating. So there we were in the back room, not quite so hot, but mighty fine, and a mug of ale apiece. <sighs> that was nice. I sure am grateful to you, John. Well, I said, shut up and let's have another ale. It's on me. And I want you to know that we had something under 800 mugs of that ale before the evening was over. And that ale is all right. And pretty soon we were talking like old pals, John Smith and me. Say, say well, what do you do for a living, John? I'm a newspaper man, John. I'm an old newspaper man myself. That's so. I said, and I didn't tell him I was in the classified department selling ads over the counter. Yeah, many years ago. Great business, I said, and hoped he wouldn't pursue the subject. Well, it was. I <laughs> I mean, I wasn't a reporter or anything like that. Well, let's have another ale, huh? Yeah, yeah, I, I'll get it. I, I was in the classified department selling ads over the counter. I pretty near dropped my mug, but he was on the way to the bar. And when he came back, he handed me mine, sat down, and grinned at me. Yes, sir. Just ten years ago tomorrow that I left the business. That's so? Yep. That Healy, that boss I had, he hated me. I guess. Do you remember it just as plain? We had a bottle stashed away in the men's room, and I went in to take a little snort, and this Healy came right in after me. Just as I was lifting up the bottle. You know what he did? Huh? He knocked that bottle right out of my hand and busted it all over the floor. Well, <laughs> Yeah, that's what I said. You're, you're fired, he said. And I said, who cares about being fired, but why'd you have to bust a bottle? And with that, I swung on <laughs> Yes, sir. You, you, you know what happened? Uh. He called me up and apologized that night and begged me to come back to work. What do you think of that? Ten years ago tomorrow. Uh, I smacked a cop once at the Hawthorne plant in Chicago. Good. Say, I did that once, too, in Akron, Ohio. I was smoking in the yard, and he came up on his bicycle and called me out of my name. I knocked him right off his bike. Uh, this cop I hit had a bike, too. Isn't that funny? I remember so well. It was my birthday. I was 22 years old, 1923, uh, April 2nd. <laughs> I was 22 years old, too. Only it was in 1913. It was in April, too, uh, I think. Uh, coincidence, huh? Uh, coincidence. Yeah. I used to have an awful temper. Yeah, me too, blazing. Bad. Uh, yeah. So you're a newspaper man. Was well, once. Small No. Uh, well, uh, red, maybe. Uh, say, John. You want me to get you a job? Uh, I can do it. No, 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 no. Thanks, John. I'm, I'm laying low for a while. I don't want any publicity. Okay. Uh, any time, though. Thanks. Say, say, I ever tell you about the time I was a newspaper man? No, that was me. No, no, me. I got fired. I ain't got fired yet. <laughs> But I didn't have long to wait. Some of the boys kept the bottle stashed away in the men's room at the office, and Tuesday morning I slipped in there just to take a little snort. Miss Callahan came right in after me just as I was lifting up the bottle. You know what he did? He knocked that bottle right out of my hand and busted it all over the floor. You're fired, he says. I says, who cares about being fired? Why'd you have to bust the bottle? When that, I swung on him. <laughs> Heard that before? Yes, yeah, so had I. Ten years after it happened to John Smith, it happened to John Smith. Yeah, I felt pretty low about it. But I got a funny thought in the back of my mind. What, what was it John Smith had said to me? You know what happened? He called me up and apologized that night and begged me to come back to work. All right, it was silly. But I decided I wouldn't tell Lucille right away. And I 
sat alongside the telephone till 11 o'clock, waiting for a call. And the phone didn't ring once. I take you now to Wednesday evening, January 4th, 1939. The scene is again McSorley's. The actors are John Smith, John Smith, and several pewter mugs of Mr. McSorley's fine product. I am speaking. I say, say, John, did you tell me your boss called you up and apologized and asked you to come back to work? People, uh, what boss? The one that fired you ten years ago. Oh, oh. Well, to be perfectly honest, John, he didn't. That was a little of malarkey I was feeding you. <laughs> you know, I'm inclined to exaggerate a little bit when I'm, you know, in, in my cups. Oh. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, why, why you ask? I was just wondering. Just thinking, you know. No, no, he, he really didn't call me up. But I met a fellow on the street a week or two later, and, and I got a job in a hotel, a uh, night clerk. <laughs> I could tell you more things about a hotel. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> Say. What? That fight you told me about with a policeman on the bicycle, like the one I had. Uh, was that phony, too? No, no. sir. Actor in the high, April 2nd, 1913. And I got a job three days later. Motorman on a streetcar. Coincidence. I smacked a policeman on a bicycle ten years later to the day, and three days after that, I get a job as a motorman in Cicero. And this time, ten years later, after John Smith got fired from his newspaper, I met a fellow on the street a couple of weeks later, and I got a job. <laughs> I hope all these dates aren't getting you all balled up, but if you just remember ten years, you'll have it. This all happened almost ten years ago. On January 26th, uh, Thursday, Lucille came running into the hotel where I was working as a night clerk. I could tell you more things about hotels. Oh, John, he's dying. Uh, who's dying? That poor old man, that John Smith. You know, the one we gave the $5 to New Year's Day at the Lafayette. Uh, he's been hurt. Why? How do you know? They just called the house, and they keep asking. Uh, who called the house? Bellevue Hospital. He's in there, and he's expected to live, and he keeps calling for you. Oh, that's too bad. Can you go right over? Why, you know I can't. I've only been on the job here for two days, but my oh, gosh, Oh, John, I... think of that poor old man lying there all alone, and... I uh, can't do it. I can't leave. I... Wait, uh, I'll call up Bellevue. Oh, good. Uh, uh, stay there. Hurry. He's in the emergency ward. Hello, Bellevue. Uh, emergency ward, please. Hello, I- I'm calling about a John Smith. What? This afternoon, hit by a truck at University and Eight. This eight. afternoon, hit by a truck at University of Eight. Eight. Yeah. My name. John Smith. Uh, no, John Smith's a patient, too. Uh, we've got the same names. All right. Y- yes, that's right. Thanks. How is he? He's checking. Good. Yes? Hello? Oh. Yes. Yes, I guess I'm the one. Yes, that's right. My, my wife said you called. Okay, thanks. Yes, I'll come over in the morning and get them. Okay. Thanks. What? He's dead. And I went and got the things John Smith had left to me. No, not much. John Smith, no address, it said on a tank. Just John Smith, no address. A tight little bundle looked like papers, a shaky note scrawled across the wrappings. Dear friend John, it said. Dear friend John, you're a mighty good something or other. I couldn't read it. This is all I got to leave you, it said. Maybe you could use this stuff. You're a newspaper man. Signed, John Smith. The seal sniffled a little, and I guess I must have bawled too, especially when I cut the string and... Three dollar bills fell out. I picked them up and put them in my pocket. A tattered little old notebook with the leaves falling out. Across the cover, the legend, John Smith, his diary. Well, I 
I wasn't a newspaper man anymore, but... Why don't you go to bed now, John? You can read it tonight on the job. It'll help pass the time away. You need something to pass the time away those long nights alone behind the desk of a third-rate hotel. You need something besides phone calls, complaining there's no hot water, make those people turn down their radio. What time is it? Call me at 7 o'clock. You need somebody to talk to through those sticky early morning hours when there's nothing to read but the hotel guide and the women's page of last Friday's newspaper. I turned first to the period in the diary when John had been a hotel night clerk. Ten years before me. John, it seemed, was no angel in his earlier days. No angel indeed. There was a girl at his hotel. Uh, some little town in Delaware. A girl who took his eye. Helen, uh, a waitress. Blonde, the diary said. Blonde and petite. And they got acquainted. They got very well acquainted. And there was an assistant housekeeper in my hotel... Mickey, her name was, black hair, snapping Irish eyes, and a laugh like Tommy Bartlett on the radio. Mickey, pretty Mickey. I used to sing to her when she was going off duty. <laughs> ah, that old song. And it seemed John Smith got in trouble over his Helen. White trouble. The diary hinted at certain unpleasantnesses ten years before. But John in his diary always insisted righteously that he loved his wife. I love Grace, one paragraph read. This is only a passing fancy. Helen is a lovely girl, but I love Grace. Well, I love Lucille. I'm a straight more of this old romance, I thought sleepily. I put my arms down on the switchboard, laid my head on them, and dropped off to sleep. And woke up with Mickey standing at the counter laughing at me. Hey, wake up and go home to your wife, she said. It's morning and I got work to do. John, have you read all that poor old man's diary yet? He's not a poor old man. He was just ten years older than I am. Is that so? He looked lots older. Ten years older than me to the day. Have you read it all yet? No, why? Well, I'd like to read it, too. Yeah, when I get finished with it. All right. Is it interesting? Sort of. Uh, John. Yes, dear? When are you going to get a raise? Well, gosh, I've only been there such a short time. But are we pretty broke? Well, a collector was here for the furniture, and I, I haven't paid the rent yet this month. You haven't? Oh, darling, it's awfully hard on your salary at the hotel, you know. Well, it's the best I can do at I'm, this time. I'm sorry, darling. What are you thinking about? I was just thinking. I might... You know what I was thinking about? I was remembering a page in John Smith's diary. Today was February 7th, 1939. The entry in John Smith's diary for February 7th, 1929. I knew it practically by heart. They've got plenty of money. There isn't a chance in the world that they're ever finding it out. Besides, when I get on my feet, I'll pay it back. I'll take 20 tonight, 20 tomorrow night. Pretty soon I'll have a hundred. And so I took 20 and 20 and 20 from the till. And I phoned the records, and I told Lucille I'd borrowed the money from a friend. That's what John Smith did ten years before. And it said so in his diary. That diary was a very strange thing. I read that John Smith broke his arm in 1908. I broke mine in 1918. John Smith was married in 1925. I was married in 1935. John Smith stole money in 1929. Ten years later, I did the same thing. John Smith had a girl named Helen in 1929. And in 1939, I had a girl named Mickey. And in 1930... John Smith fell heir to a very tidy little fortune. His great-uncle left it to him. I didn't even know I had a great-uncle, Norbert, but I wasn't at all surprised when 1940 came around and I got $30,000 from Uncle Norbert's estate. And so Lucille and I did very well, thank you, for the next few years. Lucille and I, and Mickey and I, just like John Smith did with his Helen and his Grace. Somehow or other, I didn't look at John's diary for years. It got put in the bookcase. 
You know how things are. But, well, sure, maybe it was that kind of subconscious stuff you read about. Maybe I didn't want to read it, or my subconscious didn't want me to. So, there it sat till last Wednesday. I pulled out a book, and the diary fell onto the floor. Well, I said. And I picked it up. I turned to the back of the diary, 1938, ten years ago. And before I knew it, I was engrossed in John's account of how Grace had found out about Helen and what happened. And the door opened and Lucille stormed in. Well, huh? you and your girlfriend, Mickey. Mickey? What are you talking don't about? Don't try to stall me. I know all about her and about you and you, you. Lucille, listen. Don't try to deny it. I know all about it. I'm going to fix you. What are you going to do? I'm going to call the newspapers. I'm going to... I'll show you. Put that phone down. Yeah, I'll show you. I'll tell everybody in town. I'll divorce you. Put That's that phone do. down. I will not. Lucille. Get away from me. I'll take you. Give me that phone. Hello? Hello? Uh... And John Smith's diary. And there on the desk beside Lucille. I tried to get the phone away from Grace, but I couldn't for a minute. And then I hit her with a desk lamp and... And the date was September 29th, 1938. Ten years ago last Wednesday, the day that John Smith became a murderer, as well as a thief. And me... Yes, I took the diary away with me. If anybody found it... Well, they haven't found me yet. They won't. Yeah, of course I know. John Smith's diary said they didn't find him either. The last entry in it is about the kind man named John Smith who gave him $5 on New Year's Day, 1939. Well, so I've got a little while left. They won't catch up with me. And I know what's going to happen to me. Ten years ago, on January 26, 1939, John Smith died. On January 26, 1949, I hope it'll be snowing. Today's Quiet Please story was Meet John Smith, John. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And G. Swain Gordon played the other John Smith. Lucille was Nancy Sheridan. As usual, music for Quiet Please is played by Albert Berman. Now, for a word about next week, here is our writer-director, Willis Cooper. Thank you for listening to Quiet, Please. Next week, I have a story for you about Beezer's Cellar. And so, until next week at this same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. And now a listening reminder... The dramatic battle between law enforcement agencies and the underworld continues on David Harding Counterspy, which you can hear over your ABC station this afternoon. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.